this, this idea of the power of light. And we're, we're going to read, I'll read this, and you, you're going to follow along with me. But he's, remember the context in which he's saying this. He's saying this right after uh, that, that marvelous uh, parable <laughs> that he taught them. And so it attaches to that. But, but it seems, if you don't know better, you'd think that he has shifted his emphasis, but he really has not. Told him the parable of the soils, of the seed. And then he talks about this lamp, this light. And I want us to think for a few minutes this morning, and we may not get all the way through this, we may come back and think about it some more together next Sunday, but this idea of the power of light. I hope you found Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25 in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, please let us know because we want to provide one for you. Mark 4, 21 to 25. Would you mind just standing one more time with me and follow along as I read these verses that come in the immediately after that powerful teaching and exposition and explanation of the parable of the soils. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And he says something to us that informs us, instructs us, challenges us. And I pray today that we will hear that and take that in purpose again as children of light, to bring light, the light of the gospel of God wherever we go. Thank you. Be seated. You know, you, you go back to the beginning of time, as recorded in the, in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. Time as we understand time is set into motion around this whole idea of light when the Creator God said, let there be light. Otherwise, there would have been nothing but indistinguishable darkness. But light drove back darkness. Light set itself up as opposed to darkness, contrasted with it, so that we really draw our idea of days from God's inserting light into the cosmos. You know, you go through the scriptures sometime, get your concordance out, and just do a search of the word light, L-I-G-H-T. Do a search of it and see what the scripture has to say about it. It's a fascinating study of that word. But you'll remember as it shows up through the Old Testament and then also becomes the teaching, one of the teaching issues and realities in the New Testament. One thing stands out in my mind is when God was bringing the plagues upon Egypt, do you remember? One of them was utter darkness cast over the land of Egypt, except where? In the land of Goshen, where the Hebrews stayed. There was light in Goshen, though there was darkness at midday throughout Egypt. As if God was saying, I am the light. Anything besides me is darkness. In fact, Jesus said something like that in, in his ministry. He said, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And I reminded, and I mentioned a few minutes ago, that Jesus said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We get the commentary earlier in Genesis 3 about people who will not come to the light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to be exposed by the light. But those who, 
who love, love the Lord will come to the light so that it may be seen that what they are and what they do traces itself back to the power of God. And so this idea of light, Jesus uses in something of a different way here in this portion of Mark. I want us to see in the next few minutes to the extent that we can look at it. This, first of all, questions concerning the value of light. Secondly, facts about the power of light. Third, an exhortation and a warning given in the light of that. First, there's this questions concerning the value of light. He, he asks here two rhetorical questions. A, a rhetorical question is a question that's asked so as to give the answer. Uh, we do it as parents. You're not thinking about wearing that, are you? <laughs> you see? Because the answer to that is, well, no, not now. I'm, I'm about to change. The, question, the way the question is asked gives the answer, doesn't it? And that's the way it is, is here. He says to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket? And you could read it if you want to get the flow. A lamp is not brought in to be put under a basket, is it? <laughs> well, of course not. A lamp is not brought in to be put under a bed, is it? Rather than on a stand. He would teach in, in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that you're the light of the world. He's the light of the world, and, and when you encounter him and love him and, and, and follow him and saved by him, then you become light bearers. We've, we've done that here in this place in times past, and, and you've probably done it in other places where you have the occasion for everything to be just pitch black and then uh, light a match, might light a candle, touch a candle to a candle, and then what was utter darkness begins to disappear and dissipate. It, Darkness always gives way to light. It always backs up from it. The light was not able to overcome him, John says in, in his prologue that we just read. So, light drives back darkness. Light illumines paths. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Light, however, not only overcomes darkness, it exposes that which was in the darkness. It reveals, it uncovers. And so here's how I want you to think about this for a few minutes today. The light of the gospel comes to you and to me to show us at once our utter sinfulness and Jesus' utter willingness and uh, propriety to save. It's proper that he be the Savior. He's the only one qualified. And that light dawns on us. The prophet said that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. That great light, remember that star that hung over Bethlehem telling them, here's where the, here's where the light is. Here's where the source of light is. In the light of teaching on the soils, the, the idea that, that we must sow promiscuously, we must scatter seed, gospel seed wherever we go, Knowing it's going to fall, someone's going to fall on the, on the hard path and not take root. Someone's going to fall uh, among, uh, in, in a shallow place, appear to take root but die. Some's going to fall among thorns, seem to germinate but be choked out. But some is going to fall on good soil. We talked about that a few weeks ago, that there is the promise. There's the promise that if we sow we will have a harvest with the implication if we don't sow, don't expect a harvest. And so now he takes that parable and says, what about light? Light is given to be placed on a stand. A lamp stand is the idea here. Light is given to dis be displayed so that darkness will be dispelled and so that the way can be seen by the illumination of light. And having said that, asking these rhetorical questions, he then speaks to some facts about the power of light. For nothing, look at verse 22, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, 
nor is anything secret except to come to light. You know, we should have learned that from our first parents, Adam and Eve, who when they sinned against God, the first thing they did was they retreated into something of a dark setting. They retreated to hide themselves from God. And God comes in, they couldn't hide from Him. And brothers and sisters, this is an awesome reality. Nothing that we've put into secret will stay there. But rather, it will come to the light. It will be made manifest. When Jesus Christ comes back, the, the Scriptures tell us in different places about how we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will receive uh, in response to our lives live for Him. The Scripture says every word is remembered and judged. Every idle word. It may be hidden now, but not for long. We say this to our children. It's a mercy of God to find you out in your sin. It is. If we could be left in our sins, it would ruin us. It would destroy us. But it's God's mercy to, to have that discovered in whatever way, whether we whether our conscience is pricked and we come clean with it or whether someone else comes to us like the, like the prophet Nathan and says, you're who I'm talking about. However God brings it, it's a mercy that our deeds are not allowed to remain in the darkness. But for those who have not yet trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's the life you live. You live a life in darkness. You operate in the dark. It's interesting because you're surrounded by the light. Some of you here have family members who are not yet followers of Christ, and, and you are light unto them, and they live in darkness. And you, you wonder sometimes, you scratch your head and say, why can't they, can't they see this? And the answer is naturally, by nature, no. They're blinded by the God of this world, Scripture teaches us. So hear Jesus Christ as he gives this exhortation, after he tells some facts here, he says, nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. You ever thought about that? Sometimes people think they hide things to keep from, keep them from being discovered. Jesus says anything hidden is only hidden so that in time it'll be manifest and no longer hidden. Nothing, nor is anything secret except it come to light. Why is that? Because the light has dawned. And the light is ever stretching and ever reaching. And the gospel light is advancing around the world. Sometimes we don't see that in our little corner of the world, but it is. And I think sometimes, I was talking to our leaders yesterday, our life group leaders, I think sometimes we may let the devil uh, do us ill and accuse us there may be some of you sitting here right now that the devil just beats you up. That you're, not, you're not faithful enough. You're, you're not making a vital contribution in your life and stewardship to the gospel. Those are lies, brothers and sisters. I want to tell you something. We don't say this to one another enough. But I bless God and thank God for, for the growth that I get to see in you. And I don't pretend that I know all the growth. But I see growth. I see spiritual growth. I see a deeper longing and yearning for Christ's likeness. A burden to see the lost brought to Christ. A growing hatred for sin when it's discovered. Those are all indications that the light, the light is pushing back the darkness. Nothing, nothing secret except to come to light. And so here, as Christ followers, here's our options. We can hide it knowing that it's going to come to light, or we can, we can confess it. We can say, dear God, I bring this before you. Take this. Help me to crucify that flesh and live for you. And the reason we need to do it that way is this, the next verse, is this exhortation and warning. Verses 23 to 25, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He's, he says, do you hear me? I just explained the parable to you. Do you hear me? Are you listening? And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. 
we talked about it a few weeks ago that, that whether we like it or not, we are accountable to God for every aspect of gospel seed that's ever been sown on our behalf. Whether that's our, our per personal reading of the scripture, whether it's our personal prayer time, whether it's gathered prayer time, gathered searching the scriptures together, all these exposures we have. The, the simple standing still and beholding the stars and the seas and knowing that he is God. All of that, that's, that's kind of, I found myself a few times on our trip, standing out on the balcony, just thinking, behold the work of our God. And this God who is so vast, so immense, has drawn near to us in Christ. And it's humbling in a new and a fresh and a, and a wonderful way that we, we say, we can't hide anything from you. The psalmist asked it in Psalm 139, where can I go to hide from you? And the answer is no, nowhere. And so we as Christians have no business hiding from God. We, we need to live our lives just as transparent and open books. And when the Spirit convicts us of sin, we need to repent of that sin and ask forgiveness and know that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then walk as children of light because we know those who are yet in darkness. And we can holler at them, are you blind? Can't you see? And the answer is, yes, I'm blind. And no, I can't see. <laughs> Until the light dawns in them like it did in you and me. Just as our eyes were opened. He says, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. The context of this is, to the extent, extent that you scoop into the bag of seed and scatter it promiscuously. And that, that is the measure to be brought back to you. If we determine that for whatever reason, whatever excuse, whatever the devil's done to us to convince us we don't have any anything we bring to this ministry, if we let the seed sit there, gospel seed that someone sowed on our behalf so that we came to Christ, if we let it sit there, and he says, the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. Isn't that wonderful? Scooping up the gospel seed, scattering, sometimes thinking, I don't think I'm doing any good, but but the Spirit of God says, keep scattering. But the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. And then the warning. For to the one who has, more will be given. That's a wonderful promise. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And you remember this in the parable of the talents, of the man who distributed talents. One and two and five and went away and came back. The one he'd given to said, look, I've doubled what you gave me. The other one, I've, look what I've, what I've done with what you gave me. The one who had given, given one, he said, look, I didn't want to lose this, so I just buried it. I knew that you were harsh. And I, didn't want to, I didn't want to subject myself to your scorn for losing this. See, here's the beauty of what we're talking about here, folks. You can't, this, the gospel of Jesus Christ is something you cannot lose by giving it away. The blessing of the Lord in our lives is something you cannot lose by, by pur purposing to bless others. And in that parable, he said, okay, so you knew I was wicked, I was, I was harsh, as if I delight in punishing. I'm going to take what you had, and I'm going to give it to the one who made use of what I gave him. That's the powerful picture here. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The gospel seed is there, brothers and sisters. The bag is there. The sack is there. Every one of us have been given a sack. When we were saved by grace through faith, we were given a sack of gospel seed. And to try as hard as you might, you can't empty that bag. It's like 
the cruise of oil in Elijah's day. That woman kept pouring from that, and it kept being there full. And when you scoop in and take up gospel seed and purpose to share the gospel with others in your words and in your deeds, then the, the bag continues to fill up. But if you leave it alone, then what you have will be taken away. It's a great warning. How are we to respond to this? How should you and I respond to this ex explanation of light, the value of light, and the power of light, the questions that have their obvious answers, then the warning that comes? Well, here's the way we respond. We pledge, dear Lord, I'm thankful that somebody loved you enough and loved me enough to sow gospel seed in my life. In fact, many of us could say, I'm thankful for that, for that line of people. Maybe a mom, maybe a dad, maybe a, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe a peer, maybe a, a, a relative, maybe a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe, maybe a pastor. That somebody loved you enough and loved me enough to sow gospel seed in my life. And Lord, I want... I want to be a person like that. I'm done with thinking I can take over and manage and organize and, and provoke responses from people. Forgive me for that, Lord. I'm done with thinking, well, I'm not doing any good. Forgive me for that, Lord. I want to, with the help of your Spirit, because I believe in God the Father and in Jesus Christ the Son and in the Holy Spirit and in the virgin birth, because I believe in these realities that are gospel realities. I want to take that sack of gospel seed and distribute it. Sow it continually. Because, you see, 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, and I'm going to close with these verses here, says, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. You see, if we lived in the darkness... That no notice would be taken that our, that our bag of gospel seed just continues to sit there. But we live in the light. We're children of the day. First John says this in, in verses 5 through 7 of chapter 1. This is the message that we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. We shared that together today in the Lord's Supper. God is light, we said together. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we are having fellowship with Him, that is communion with Him, while we're walking in the darkness, John says we're not telling the truth, we're, we're lying, we're not practicing the truth. But if we're walking in the light as He is in the light, look what happens. We're having fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son is cleansing us from all sin. We make a new commitment, Lord. I'm not a child of the darkness. <laughs> Why would I be trying to go back there? Why would I, as a follower of Christ, saved by, by that gospel light that pierced into me, why would I think I could hide anything in the darkness? Only, the only business I have with the darkness as a follower of Christ is to take my light into it and drive that darkness back. And that's what you do. That's what you're doing. Many of you, most of you, I would say, are taking the light of Jesus Christ into situations when you go, are bringing the light to bear. And here's, here's the challenging thing. That means if you remove yourself from that, you take the light out of that. Be faithful, brothers and sisters. Persevere. Believe these words of the Lord. To him who has, our Savior says this, to him who has, more will be given. Do you have Christ? Yes. Do you perhaps with, with trembling frailty <laughs> share Christ? Because you have and you are, more will be given. And you will. The promise is you will as you go forth sowing with precious seed. You will come again rejoicing. 
Maybe you were sowing in tears. Maybe, maybe you weep as you pray for a, a son or a daughter or a, or a spouse or a, a loved one, a neighbor, a co-worker. As you go forth weeping, sowing those precious gospel seeds, you shall come again rejoicing, bringing the fruit of that, the sheaves, those, those plants that have sprung up as the fruit of the seed sowing, bringing that with you. That's the promise. So I want you to be encouraged today. Don't you let the devil, whether he uses pricking your conscience or whether he uses the words of somebody else, don't let him discourage you. Don't let him think, well, I, I don't see anything happening. The happening is God's business. <laughs> the sowing is ours. So, go from here with your bag of gospel seed, rejoicing that somebody reached into their bag of gospel seed, perhaps several somebodies, and scooped it up and sowed it in your heart and sowed it. And perhaps one time your heart was hard and stony. Maybe another time you, it, was, it was a shallow thing and you, you sprung up and you had some joy, but then it withered and, and faded. And, but you see, if you're a Christ follower here today, at some point along the way, your heart became fertile soil for the gospel. And when it was sown in you, it grew up bearing fruit. I appreciate what Brother Curtis brought to you the last two weeks on, on, on the fruit of a disciple, what a disciple looks like, the fruit-bearing nature of a disciple. The seed we have. The promise we have. The help of the Spirit we have. What will we do? Well, let's commit today in a new and fresh way. As certainly as we've, we've renewed our covenant before the Lord with one another and we've celebrated the new covenant in the Lord's Supper, let's renew and recommit today that this bag of seed is not going to sit idle. I'd love it if someone said, I'm going, to, I'm going to test the Lord. I'm going to prove the Lord here. I'm going to reach into this thing and scatter so much seed and see if it empties. I promise you what's going to happen. It's going to stay full. It's going to get fuller. And you're going to see people brought to Christ that perhaps at one time you longed for and then somewhere along the way you've kind of given up on. No, this is not the time to give up. Come to the light. Jesus Christ. As his light enlightens and refreshes you, then hear him. Have ears to hear. Be careful what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. And then sow. And in his time, in his way, by his power, just as the darkness that you sat in was pierced by his gospel light, so the darkness that others are sitting in now will be pierced by that gospel light to the praise of the glory of the God of grace. Will you go with me? We're so new and fresh. Repent of weariness. Say, oh Lord, your light washes over me and renews me. So my weariness is passing. But your love is abiding. We'll live as children of light, God being our helper. We'll walk in the light as he is in the light. And we'll have fellowship with him and with the Son and fellowship with one another. And we will know and tell the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives as sinners saved by grace. Let's pray.